Hey there, whether you are a part of our church family or a friend tuning in, we love that you are here and pray that you might hear from God today. It's our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from them, we ask that they only be supplemental and in no way replace a commitment to gathering and learning within a local church. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but are never meant to replace our belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove Church and what we're up to, head to cglife.org and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, simply email info at cglife.org. Now we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Hey, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you, church family. I want to invite you to stand, whether you're joining us online today or here in the room, let's worship our God and our King, amen? that chasm so we 
worship you today for what you've done, Christ. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living could imagine so great a mercy what heart could
of heaven Who else could make every king bow down Who else can whisper in darkness trembles Only a holy God What other beauty demands such praise? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold the one and the only Cry sing holy forever a holy God Come and worship a holy God And what are the glory God, you've already begun this day by showing us more of yourself. In the songs that we've sung, 
God, we see you for who you are. You are set apart, you are holy, yet you're so close. You're so close that you walk with us, even in the valley of the shadow of death, you are near. And so you are other, yet you are so close. And we just, we worship you. We stand amazed that that is even possible. And it's only possible by the blood of Jesus. So God, as you continue to reveal yourself, Holy Spirit, we ask you to do that through your word as it's open, as it's taught. Do a work in our life, change us. We don't wanna walk out the same person that we walked in to be because we want to encounter you, a holy God. So do what only you can do, God. Our lives are in the palm of your hand. Change us, mold us, shape us. Holy Spirit, work in us and through us. We love you and we pray all this to the glory of your name alone. Amen and amen. You guys can take a seat. I did not expect that. <laughs> but that's good. I'll, um, I'll go away for a while and come back again. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I feel the same way. Camped out a little bit in 1 Thessalonians 2 and was struck by something Paul says at the end of that chapter. He says, he, to the Thessalonians, he says, what, what is our hope or our joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? What, what do we have to, to hope in, to boast in, to joy in? And he says, is it not you? To the Thessalonians. For you are our glory and joy before Christ on that final day. To be able to point to you, Thessalonians, and say, Lord, here is the fruit of my labor, and you worked in them through the ministry you gave me, and do you see a glimmer of Jesus? If you do, that's my hope, my joy of boasting, nothing as your pastor makes me happier than to see the mark of Jesus shining through your life more and more of him. So I'm glad to see you. The only reason I come back from sabbaticals is to check up on you for, for 11 months to make sure you're still growing in Christ Jesus. Well, I have missed you, and I'm glad to be back. And uh, I did not expect that, but I got to tell you, it feels good. Now, whenever we approach a, a new church year, like we're doing today, one of our practices, one of our habits at Center Grove has, has been to have a Lord's Supper together. And we do it very intentionally because the supper helps us, it reminds us of who our center is and of what our center should be. The supper reminds us really of what binds us together. It isn't that we like each other so much as that we are in love with him. And he's working in each of us and his love for us and our love for him draws us closer together and gives us a love for each other. He is the one who binds us together as a church family, the Lord Jesus. And so it's just, it, it fits, it suits when we start a new church year to do that with the Lord's Supper. Now, I've got to tell you, I, when I went away on sabbatical, 
just before I left, I shared this with the deacons. I, I've, I've had a sense of um, a couple of things, and I spent a good deal of my time, perhaps more so in this sabbatical than ever, just praying for us and over us and about us in this season that we're in as a church and in this cultural moment that we're experiencing, a cultural moment so full of change and so full of uncertainty. It's been clear to me and it's been made even clearer still how weary our world is. There's a spirit of uncertainty and of heaviness and anxiousness and uncertainty and discouragement and fear and anger, and it seems to be everywhere. And it's not only outside the church, but it's inside the church as well. And, I, and I've realized this, and I've sensed this. I sensed this before I left. I shared this with the deacons. It's, it's really been heavy on me that it's been so heavy on us, this season of uncertainty and so on. So I felt compelled to pray and to ask that uh, God would give us something. And what I've been praying for is that God would give us a season of refreshing. That he would give us a, a season of spiritual refreshing, a season of spiritual uh, reviving, just as the psalmist prayed in Psalm 85, where he says, will you not, Lord, please revive us again, that your people may properly rejoice in you. It's hard to rejoice in the Lord when there is a spirit of heaviness about you and fear and worry. The author of Lamentations pleads, restore us, Lord, to yourself, that we may be restored, renew our days like they were before, renew them. Now, Jesus, of course, he is the great restorer. He is the great refresher, right? He's the uh, giver of that living water that wells up into eternal life. He is the bread of life. And Jesus promises that whoever comes to me will not hunger, whoever comes to me will not thirst. And he says to his people, as well as to the world, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He doesn't just restore and refresh us when we come to him the first time. He intends for us to come to him and keep coming to him, for he is the giver of living water. He is the only bread that satisfies. And I, I want to remind you that he is the cure for a weary world. And he is the cure for a weary church. And wherever Jesus is in his presence, uncertainty and heaviness and anxiousness and uncertainty uh, of, uh, in, in the world and its events, discouragement, fear and anger, wherever he is, those things cannot stand for very long. One of the critical ways that his people are meant to be refreshed and restored is, is by way of uh, uh, the right celebration of the Lord's Supper. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your Bibles out, and I want you just to rest. And uh, this is, this is I want to spend a little bit of time getting you ready for the supper today. This, this is really important, I think, for where we are with who we are. I want you to take your Bibles and look with me this morning at Luke 22. We want to see together verses 14 through 20, which is Luke's record of the very first Lord's Supper. And uh, I want you to read it together with me. Let's take a look, shall we? And when the hour came, Luke twenty two fourteen, 14, <clears throat> Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. <clears throat> 
For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, there are three realities that I want you to see this morning. I want to draw to your attention. The first is found in verses 14 to 15, and that is the fact, first of all, of Jesus' earnest desire for the Last Supper with his people that's recorded here. He says, I earnestly desired this, which is strange because following the supper comes a cross. But he says, I earnestly, passionately want this supper with you. Secondly, I want you to notice in verse 16, the fact not only of his earnest desire, but of his anticipation of a greater supper with his people that is to come. And then finally, in verses 17 to 20, I want you to notice with me the fact of his command for a new supper to be held regularly between the last supper and the greater supper. Now, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time in the first two, but I do want to set them up so that we can understand the third, this new supper, this what we call the Lord's Supper that we share in. Now, look with me in verses 14 to 15 and see with me the fact of Jesus' earnest desire for this last supper with his people. Luke tells us that with this supper, it it takes place during the Jewish Passover It's when the Jews were remembering God's grace and his power in rescuing them from slavery in Egypt. And that Passover meal uh, featured uh, unleavened bread, multiple cups of wine, and an unblemished lamb, all commemorating the meal the Israelites shared before their great mass departure at night from their Egyptian captors. The bread represented God's provision. God said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to set you free, but I'm not going to leave you be. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide the bread for you. The cup represented the blood that was spread. Some of you will remember the story on the doorposts and the lintel. So that when the angel of judgment came, the angel would pass over the home of that faithful believing Jewish family. So the blood, the cup pointed to the blood that was shed. So this meal that is recorded for us here is rightly called the Last Supper for two reasons. First, because Jesus intimates this is the Last Supper I'm going to have until a greater supper comes. But secondly, because he's also intimating that this old supper is going to pass, this old Passover is going to pass in favor of a new and different supper. It's going to be effectively replaced by another. It was, the old supper was a pointer a pointer to what the disciples have already witnessed in the life of Jesus and are about to witness in his death. The old Passover is passing away. Something new is coming. A a new kind of meal is now in order. God's promise of deliverance is about to be kept in a final and an ultimate way with the public humiliation and sacrifice of his very own son as the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is why Jesus earnestly, and I love this, passionately wanted this supper, watch now, watch now, watch now, wanted this supper with his people because he knew this supper pointed to exactly what they needed. And the reason, you see, it makes no sense. Why would he be so passionate? about going to a cross. The only way to explain that is the extraordinary depth of his love for the people who would benefit from what was going to transpire there. I passionately, earnestly desire to have this meal with you because I want you to get what I'm about to give. And I don't want you to miss it. It's the love of Christ. 
what a weary world needs and what weary believers need is what he's about to deliver. But I want you to see next with me in verse 16, the fact of Jesus' anticipation of a greater supper with his people. Jesus knows he he must suffer and die following this meal, but he also knows that there's a better one coming. There is, as we've seen before, a marriage supper of of this lamb that is to come, a great feast that's going to mark the fulfillment of all that God has planned for them in Christ. This Christ who is himself the Passover lamb, it's going to mark the restoration of all things under his lordship and and rule. It's going to mark the day when, when God's people, all of God's people are going to be welcomed into a restored heaven, a new heaven, welcomed into a restored, into a new earth that is like this one, but infinitely better, unmarked and unscarred by sin and failure. He's anticipating a greater supper that's going to mark all of those things. He's going to welcome his church in that supper. He's going to welcome us home. Something to think about, to dwell on, huh? And that's why he says in verse 16, he makes a vow. He says, I tell you, I'm not going to eat it, another Passover meal, until it is fulfilled, until it's made a full reality in the kingdom of God. When the time comes when God's rule over all things is fully restored. But see finally with me the fact of Jesus' command for a new supper to be held regularly between the first and this greater. In verses 17 to 20, the key verse here, the key phrase here for us is do this in remembrance of me. Or if you have your Bibles and you make notes in your Bible, write this down. He's basically saying, keep me in mind. Keep me front of mind. Do this so that you keep me front of mind. It's important. I'm going to show you why. Most of us, of course, are familiar with this command of Jesus. We are familiar. We've heard that before, most of us. But I wonder if we don't miss the fact that it's a command and not a request or a suggestion. This meal is weighty. It isn't optional. Indeed, one of the marks of a true church is the faithful remembrance of the resurrected Lord's life and cross death and promises shown in this supper. And one of the marks of a healthy believer is a right, faithful, and earnest desire to share it with others, like Jesus' earnest desire to share the first supper with his first disciples. But I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if we haven't lost this fact and made the supper optional. I have been troubled, I have to say, that when we have a Lord's Supper on a Sunday evening and we announce it, there are very few people who come back. I just, I've got to tell you, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I don't know why that is. And and I've tried, I've tried to sort that out in my mind and my heart. I wonder if we haven't lost the fact that this is a command. Rusty, you were in the military. If your commanding officer gave you a command, did you tell him you'd think about it? You never did make it to the brig, did you? No, sir. No, sir. You were a Marine, right? Amen. Amen. (laughs) He said amen. I don't know that that's a religious uh, (laughs) reality, but okay. But I wonder why. You know, I've got to say, I've got to say, I wonder, is there a loss of love in us for Jesus? And a loss of a desire to please him? I wonder, is there maybe among us a lessening or a loosening of his lordship and a lessening in us of a desire to follow his lead? I mean, he says, do this. He doesn't say think about it. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Or could it be that there's a lack of understanding and a sense of the why behind the command? 
Just what is it then that, that Jesus wants us to remember when we remember him and why? Why does he think it's so important that we do this remembering him? Perhaps we need to see plainly the content we are to remember and the purpose behind it. So look with me again at verses 70 to 20. What specifically are we to remember? Look, look carefully with me there. In verses 17 to 20, what we find is Jesus using this last Passover meal with its unleavened bread and four different cups of wine and an unblemished lamb, lamb to prepare his disciples for his own death and to give them and us a way to remember and reflect on it and him after he's risen and ascended to heaven. So, so what's happening here is the bread that represented God's provision for life for his people in the Exodus now represents God's provision for life eternal for those who are his people in Christ. And, and it's represented with a bread that is Christ's own body. Now, this is vital. This is important to understand. Go deeper with me here. Go deeper with me here. This is important. This is my body. Listen, when, when the Jews thought about the body of a person, they didn't think just about the physical flesh and blood. The body represented the person in his or her totality. What Jesus is showing, what Jesus is saying is that this gift of new and eternal life that he gives is made possible by his whole incarnate life. His whole teaching, his whole ministry, his entire work. All that he was and all that he did. And so with this bread then, he's saying, in my coming, in my living, in my dying, in my raising, all of me, all of me is given for all of you. Leaving heaven was for you. Taking on human flesh was for you that humiliation made even greater at the cross. It was for you. Notice verse 20, the cup that follows. The scripture says, and likewise the cup after they'd eaten, saying, Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, the cup. That in the Passover represented the lamb's blood smeared on the doorposts and the lentils now represents the blood of the lamb of God whose shedding takes away sin, opens the way to God. You see, in the old covenant, God's relationship with his people was made and kept valid by sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Sacrifices made by priests who were themselves sinners for people who were themselves sinners. But now, there has been made or will be made in this text one sacrifice to come made by one perfect priest who offers his own perfect life for sinners. And that sacrifice was once and done. Nothing else needed. Nothing else to be added. Done. Done. So now there's this new covenant relationship that's come, made valid once and for all by a sinless priest giving himself as a perfect sacrifice. And where the old deliverance set God's people free from captivity in Egypt, this new deliverance is a rescue from the ultimate slavery to sin and self and death. And so when Jesus takes the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you, he's saying that a new rescue is coming and for us it has come. A rescue from sin to salvation, from death to life, from Satan's realm to God's eternal kingdom. And again he says, remember me, keep this front of mind Remember that with the ultimate gift of my blood, I paid the ransom for your freedom. I made the way for you to be set free. I've given you everything you need to live the life that is truly life. And there are two little words. Do you see them in verses 19 and 20? Two little words. 
that we cannot, we must not, we should not miss. Do you see them there? It's for you. For you. For you. Some of the most beautiful words in all of the scripture for those who have ears to hear it. For you. Say it out loud, for me. Tell your neighbor, for you. Have you ever gotten a great gift and you just couldn't believe it? And all you could get out of your mouth was for me? How many of you have gotten that kind of gift? How many of you are still waiting for that kind of gift? <laughs> Come on, how many of you gotten it? How many of you are still waiting? Okay. <laughs> All right. If any of your loved ones have just seen your hand go up and say, and you're still waiting, I'm telling you, there's your assignment. <laughs> Give them a gift that's going to blow them away, that's going to make them say, for me? Yeah, for me. That's the way we should see. Continually. The Lord Jesus Christ. All of him. For me. For me. For me. For you. Jesus says then with his whole life and the very blood of his life, he gave us all. His all. He says, remember me. I became a man for you. I gave the gospel to you. I suffered for you. I died for you. I was raised for you. I've returned to heaven for you. I'm making a place for you. I'm coming again for you. All I did, I did for all of you who put your faith in me alone. We are not the center of the universe, God is. But by some great mystery of God, we are at the very heart of the God who is at the center of the universe. This is why you should never let anybody else tell you who you are or what you're worth. This is extra, this is not my notes, but it just occurred to me. This is why you should never let anybody else tell you who you are or what you're worth. He's already decided those two things and those two matters are settled. You are his and you are at the very center of his heart. For me? Now, all of this is at the heart of what we should remember. And I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and say it. These are old gospel truths. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if we think we've gotten the go- we've heard the gospel, okay, the essence of the gospel, and we think we've gotten it all down. I need to say to our church family, The gospel may be simple, but the gospel is incredibly deep. You may know the basics of the gospel, but I don't think you and I will fully comprehend the gospel even after we've been in God's presence for a million years. The old gospel truths, simple yes but deep, are truths that we're meant to to seek to understand more and better so that they grow deep into our minds and into our hearts. We never get to the bottom of them. But the more and the better we understand them, 
For example, that Christ has set us free. The more and the better we understand them, the more and better we will remember and reflect on him in his supper and with our lives. It's hard to remember somebody you've never known. So I don't blame people who don't know Christ for not being interested in the supper. But I will tell you this, the more and the better you know him, the more and the better you will want to celebrate him in this thing called the supper. I celebrate him well when I have come to remember him and know him well. Now, I got to tell you, that put me back on my heels a little bit because I thought, all right. Are we not understanding? Are we not growing in our understanding of the gospel? This is not a once and done thing. There's so much to Christ. There's so much to his, his life, his death. The way in which he came. The way in which he calls us, restores us, renews us. There are connections and interconnections. We'll never get to the bottom of it. But the more you understand, the more you have to celebrate. This is why preaching is so important. Teaching is so important. Bible study is so important. Daily times in the word are so important. It is from, from time spent in the word, we come to know him better and love him more and find we have more to celebrate. But specifically why? I'll tell you. There are lots of reasons why he gives us this command, but let me put it to you as simply as I can. Here it is. The scripture lays down this principle. The more we keep Christ front of mind, the more we spend and invest our lives, to put it in the words of the Apostle Paul, beholding him. Seeing him as he is, reflecting on him, reveling in him, rejoicing in him, pursuing him like Paul who says to the Philippians, I just want to know him. Paul, you're, you're a great apostle. I know, I know, I know, but I just want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know more of Christ. The scripture says that when we live our lives with Christ front of mind, And when we live beholding him continually, the more in turn we become like him. Absolutely critical. Our transformation depends on our vision. Of Christ. God's ultimate purpose for you and for me is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And remembering Him as Christ commands us to do in the supper, remembering Him brings transformation to us. To remember Him is to reflect on Him, and to reflect on Him is to look intently with focus on who He is. It is to behold Him to see him as he is, to keep him in view as we live. And those who do that find that they're transformed more and more to be like him. They know him more and more personally, more and more intimately. And this is the process Paul describes for us in 2 Corinthians 3 where he says, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil that keeps us from seeing Christ is removed and we're saved. That's a description of salvation. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, he says, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The freedom to see and behold Christ as he is given. I love that. When I come to faith in Christ, I'm given the freedom to see him, to gaze at him, to know him, to walk with him personally. And then Paul goes on to say, and then as a result, we all, who now with unveiled face, we now behold the glory of the Lord. And as we do, we're being transformed into the same image as the Lord, from one degree of glory to another. 
What a beautiful picture of the Christian life. Christ, front of mind. My heart and my mind set on him. The more I see him, the more I view him, the more I behold him, the more I become like him, the more my life is transformed, the more I realize God's purpose for me, which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So, loved ones, here's what I want you to see. Every Lord's Supper is like a big corporate check-in. I wanted to say weigh in, kind of like Weight Watchers, but we won't do that. (laughs) But the Lord's Supper is like a big corporate check in where we gather together and we check our vision. We ask ourselves questions, both as a church. And as individuals, we have to. Because remembering and reflecting on Christ and what he's done and what he's doing faithfully in us always encourages further reflection on our faithfulness to him. So we ask questions like this. Are we as a church living with Christ at the center? Do we see him? Do we behold him in our worship? Are we living together beholding him? Life groups, life group leaders, this is a question for you. As a group together when we gather, are we gathering to behold Christ or are we gathering to behold each other? Is our center Christ or is our center each other? Can we say as a life group, as we've walked through the past year, that we know this Jesus better and love him more, not because we've been together, but because together we've been with Jesus. Are we as a church becoming more like him? Are we dishonoring him in some way? And to each individual, this remembering that Jesus commands in the supper brings similar questions. Am I living with Christ at the center of my life? Do I live looking for him? Do I live seeing him? Am I living beholding him? Is it a regular routine in my life to meet him in his word? To be with him so that I might go with him through whatever is in my day? Am I really truly becoming more like him? Am I dishonoring him in some way with sin? You see, the supper, when it's done to remember and reflect rightly on him, what it does is it uncovers every place of new victory to celebrate since the last supper that we shared in together. Every new supper gives us uh, an opportunity to celebrate every step of spiritual progress made from the last gathering. And it also uncovers every place or area of unfaithfulness and ingratitude that may have crept in, that needs to be confronted, that needs to be dealt with. And that is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, listen, before you come to the table, you need to examine yourself. Before you partake, you need to examine yourself. You need to ask, how am I doing? How well am I following? How well am I loving? How much more of him do I know than the last time I heard do this and remember me? It's check-in. For all of us as church, it's check-in. For each of us as individuals, it's a check-in. Is God getting to see what he wants to see when he looks at me. And what he wants to see when he looks at me is, I'm risking it here. 
Starts with a J. J, starts with a J, is... I'm praying. It's okay. That's what he wants to see. That's what he wants to see. Am I giving him what he wants to see by seeing what he's given me in Jesus? Am I giving him what he wants to see by seeing what he's given me in Jesus. That's what the supper wants us to ask. And that's why Jesus says, do this and remember me. This matters. Okay? Now I'm going to put you on notice. I know this is strong. We got guests here today and say, Good night. All the other past preachers before him, they were so nice. <laughs> I'm nice too. I'm just passionate today. But this means, listen, listen, listen. I'm asking you, take it seriously. The next time you hear there's going to be a supper on Sunday night, remember Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say, this is optional. If it fits in, fit it in. No, he said, don't, don't be fitting me into your life. Fit yourself into the life I give you. Do this. Now. All right. Thank you. You received um, the cup. This is our, our workaround for these post-COVID, pre-COVID. Some of us are pre-COVID right now. We're going to get it tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> some of us just had it last week. Hopefully you're clear now, uh, but this is our post-COVID, pre-COVID. But here we're going to, to pause now, and let's do what we must do, and that is come into a time of examination. So you have this. Jesus said, this is my body given for you, my my blood represents my blood given for you. So I want us to pause. We're not going to take the supper just yet, but I want us to pause. And I want us to spend some time in the presence of the master. He promised to meet us. He's here. He's here because he loves us. He's made us his own. And he asks us today, to consider the condition of our lives as a church but also as individuals and he asks us to ask ourselves is the father who sent his one and only son for us seeing in us what he desires to see. More of Jesus. Less of you. Less of me. Look. Look to Christ. Then look to yourself. Look to Christ. Then look to yourself. And ask. What victories can I celebrate in his presence this morning? Where has he given me victory over sin? Celebrate that. 
Where is he making me more like Christ? Where is the fruit of the Spirit showing up big in my life? And I have only him to thank. Celebrate that. Celebrate that. Say, thank you, Father. And then ask the Spirit to show you if there's anything there in you that is offensive to him. It breaks his heart. It doesn't reflect the Christ who came in his holiness. Then confess that. Own it. Tell him that you're sorry. Make amends where they need to be made. Pledge to do that. And ask him as you confess it to cleanse you. He's faithful. He's just. He will. Because of what Christ has done. But look, look, look. This is no light thing right now. This is no light thing. Jesus says, remember me. Remember me. Remember me. Let's go to him in prayer. Each of us individually. Spend some time with the master. He's here. He's here. He's here. Oh, great God, maker of heaven and earth, redeemer, rescuer of our souls. I would bless you today in this moment for all that you have done for us and pledged to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for his body, his whole incarnate life, for all that he taught us, for all that he did for us in that sinless, perfect life, for his suffering in our place, for the humiliation that he faced for us. For the victory he won in the resurrection over death, over sin, over the grave, how we thank you. And Lord God, we bless you for that great supper that is yet to come, that you have invited us to and you're preparing us for even now. I thank you for that. We thank you for that. Lord God, in these moments, we're thanking you for victories you've given us over sin. 
We're thanking you, Lord, for the ways in which you are working in us so that the fruit of the Spirit is becoming more and more evident in us. We're grateful, Lord, for the character of Christ that's being forged in us, for the greater love and joy and goodness, patience, kindness, self-control that is growing. We're grateful for that. That is your work, not ours. We thank you, Father, for the way in which you're giving us victory over sin. How our ways of the past are less and less the ways of our present. How some of our past no longer surfaces anymore because you have set us free. We're thankful for that. Lord, for those sins that are still to be found in our lives. Lord God, we own them. We spread them out before you. We count them. We repent of them, Lord God. We ask for your forgiveness. And we ask for grace, more grace and help by your Spirit. See those overcome in us. Nothing's impossible for you. We believe this. We rest in you and in that truth. We thank you, Father God, that you're the God who keeps his promises. And you've promised to forgive. And we confess and repent. And we're grateful for the invitation you give us now to come together and to remember Jesus. He's front of mind right now, Father. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Are you ready? Ready? The scripture says that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body given for you, all of me for you. He offered a prayer and blessed it and then gave it. And we're going to do the same today. Who's praying for the bread this morning? All right, Mark, would you come and lead us in a word of thanksgiving for all of Christ? It's a big order. Let's do that together. Let us pray together. Father God, uh, as we bow in your presence this morning and in the quietness of this moment, we offer our highest praise to you for Jesus. Father, today we remember the broken body of our Lord and Savior. For us on the cross, that covered all our sins something we couldn't do. So, Father, today we want to um, lift you high, exalt you, and make Jesus known. Father, I pray this morning that if there's anyone who does not know you, who has never accepted you, who does not, uh, has not made that decision today, Father, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you that you would move on their hearts, that you would give them courage to do that, um, help us to come alongside those that would. And Father, just not to be ashamed of you. So Father, today we just lift you high. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And it is in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, take your wafer. This is my body, all of me, for all of you. Take, eat. This is why I came. Amen and thank you, Lord Jesus. 
scripture says the following them, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant, new relationship in my blood. He blessed that as well. And I'll invite Dave Wright to come, our chairman of the deacons, and uh, offer the blessing for the cup, for the shed blood of Christ. Holy Father, you are truly separate in righteousness, in justice, but also in love. And it is through your love, Lord, that you had your son come and uh, become a man. And though truly God and truly man, without sin, sacrificed himself for us and took upon himself the ugliness of our sin and imputed on us the beauty of his righteousness. And Lord, as we think on that and we dwell on that, and as now we partake of this cup, we're reminded that he truly did do it for us. Yes. And we give you thanks and praise in the sacrificial name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My shed blood for you. Do this and remember me. After the supper, the scripture says they sang a hymn and went out. And we will do the same uh, with perhaps some direction as well to follow. Would you stand with me? We want to celebrate. We want to reflect. We want to rejoice. What shall we sing? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, That fits, by the way very well. I'm grateful for that. Now, you know, a song is a song unless you sing it with all your heart, then it becomes worship, right? So can we make this worship today? Can we do that? Let's make this worship today. Let's think as we sing, sing with all of our hearts. Exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a feeling the Father smiles when he hears that kind of singing and that kind of worship. Are you ready? All right, let's do that together. Would you lead us?
Amen. You know, a few weeks ago we shared of how our kids ministry at their summer adventure led really our church in the way of generosity as they raised over $900 to support Diggs Latham Elementary School. And we have a photo, uh, it's gonna be up behind me. This is how they turned some funds into a connection for the sake of the gospel. Can we give God praise of how he's moving in the lives of even our kids ministry? for the sake of advancing his kingdom, amen. All the glory to God. There's gonna be uh, behind me as well, just the four different ways that you can give, that you can engage the kingdom of God as it advances, as Jesus builds his church. And you can simply just give here in the room or you can always give online. We're really grateful for a generous church that's generous to God. Whether this is your first time that you've uh, come to Center Grove here today, or if you've called Center Grove home for a long time, won't want to miss next week. We're going to dive into a new sermon series called Stewardship in a Strange New World. So invite a friend, come expectant as we wrestle with that question of how do we steward all that God has given us in this strange new world that we find ourselves in. Amen. So you won't want to miss that. We'll uh, hopefully see you next week. As we go, I want to read, this is uh, actually a verse from 1 Peter chapter 1. This is verse 3 and 4. Let's go with this hope and this peace. Uh, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and is kept in heaven for you. Go with that hope. Jesus' blood covers all your sin, and there's an inheritance that is him and that will be kept in heaven for you. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access a discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove, what we're up to, and access even more resources. Thanks again for opening God's Word with us today. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with Him.